Hello everyone, today we talk about Roman history from the end of the 14th century to 1444. You understand especially what the end is about. So, after the death of John V, that in 1390 had been uh, once again uh, removed from the throne for some month by his uh, nephew John the Seventh, who was backed by the Turks inexorably also under Manuel II Palaiologos, 1391-1425, long reign, by hand of the new Ottoman Sultan Bayezid. And towards the end of the 14th century, the Roman territory uh, on, on, uh, on land, on the continent, was reduced basically just to the capital and Morea. That was um, come back uh, in the hands of the Palaiologoi, after the dominion of the Cantacuzenoi and held by uh, a despot, vassal of the Turks. In 1393 the Ottomans completed the subjugation of Bulgaria, threatening Hungary. So this is where they were sweeping, the moment which they were sweeping in, in, in the Balkans. And in the, during the same uh, year they also occupied Thessaly you know, importantly fertile area, uh, and uh, historically speaking, in fact, one of, of, of the core land of, of the empire. And in 1395, uh, the Ottomans also rendered Valachia vassal. They launched an incursion in Morea, right, so they were pretty much on the offensive. And in 1394, furthermore, they also blocked uh, Constantinople. They isolated the Roman capital that could receive only some sporadic uh, supply sent from Venice. In front of the progress of the Ottoman conquest there was in the West a first attempt to organize a crusade of wide proportions. Albeit the Christian forces were bloodily defeated in 1396 at Nicopolis in Bulgaria. And the year after the Turks broke in, in, once again uh, into Greece, devastating it up to Moreb. Now we will make a video about the, uh, the crusade of Nicopolis, yes, surely uh, one about the battle proper. We already discussed um, technically this phase, if you go especially in the, in the Byzantine history or Ottoman history playlist, there is actually a video we made about this the same times broadly speaking, especially from the Western perspective of the story that used to say, which, which is often overlooked. It's a story often told in terms uh, the Westerners are, are either they, they were incapable, they were not really committed to the thing. Actually, the, the picture is much more articulated, not even just for saying that they all cared. Actually, the, there is a, a picture that emerges that is devastating, that is basically the Turks, as we'll see now, especially after the Timurid invasion, could be uh, I mean, the, the Ottomans were thrown into this, this civil war fundamentally, and it was just because of Western policy that they actually rose again. There was nothing deterministic specifically um, about the, the fall of Constantinople yet at this point, in spite of the great success that the Ottomans had enjoyed at, at this point. So now we tell just about in, in, in synthesis, because this video is fundamentally uh, concise story that we make of uh, so-called Byzantine history for the sake of completion, given a bit more of attention, but it's still at a somewhat superficial level, and just for the sake of disclosure and information for people that maybe have never heard of it, things like that. But we'll go more in detail, uh, more in depth with that um, in the future, hopefully. So the Crusade of Nicopolis represented a series effort carried out by Western powers to stop the Turkish advance and was promoted essentially for the defense of Catholic Hungary. Hungary, you know, at, at this point was the only serious bulwark that at this point could, could stop the Ottoman advance, but even without Western help the things were quite, quite complicated. Um, we made videos about Hungary also towards the late Middle Ages. We know what the institutional profile really was of, the deep intertwinement with all Central European policy um, and the Balkans as well. 
So we'll we'll see that also in, on another occasion. But the initiative was taken by Sigismund, King of Hungary, the uh, sole state at this point, uh, as we've seen, uh, still disposed of the necessary resources to let military operations of, of large scale, right, in this situation, um, in, in the area, which was the only state uh, in the area to dispose of the necessary resources to lead military operations of a large scale in the Balkans. Uh, also, just imagine the logistical reasons. I mean, all the, the crusade moved from essentially from Western Europe, Central Europe, to the, uh, along the Danubian line. So uh, there were important reasons. You know, Hungary had always had also previous crusades, as long as you know, at least the ones who were carried out that the routes that were still continental, still land, um, had this major, major role. Um, and uh, Hungary asked at this point to all the sovereigns of Europe for this enterprise destined to save all Christendom. This naturally was the, the major goal. And his uh, invitation, let's call it in this way, or you know, his call for help, rather, uh, was was gathered right. There was th this is important. It's not that the, the Westerners actually let things. I, I mean, every time I say you know it's all fault over the Westerners if if the Turks advance. But you know, look at Nicopolis, look at Varna. I mean, it's it's not really um, you know true. Like the, surely they could have done more at so many levels. But at the same time, the unpredictability of the whole thing. Um, wouldn't even let them imagine what could happen on the long run. Now, we know what happened with the Ottoman uh, invasions, but um, it, it was a very contingent thing, and that's something I always urge to, you know, to dip and not to, to forget that, you know, political predictions are something very short term. And so, even if in insight we can say, ah, if they didn't do this, if they didn't do that, yes, but do you know what the, the possibilities were still at some point? This is important to realize, and the effort was impressive. Two popes moved, basically Boniface the Ninth in Rome, and and the antipope Benedict the, the Thirteenth in in Avignon. This is what was the time of the Great Schism, Western Schism, and so on. Um, skip the thing, but um, the, to make long story short, was constituted uh, a great army. Sources are right out to say, ah, oh, they 100,000 men, but I mean, it was pretty large, objectively, uh, not so much, but still was a great force. Uh, the bulk of it was formed by the Hungarians, right, but it, um, it also contained thousands of men coming from, uh, flowed from France, Germany, Wallachia, uh, Italy, Spain, England, Poland, Bohemia, right. And uh, the flow of, of Europe, European nobility, in many ways, was, was there. The Genoese of Lesbos and of Chios and the Knights of Rhodes also uh, took on the task of garrison the Danubian mouth and the coasts of the Black Sea, while Venice ended up to surpass uh, the initial mm, excitation. The, the, the had been determined by the intention to start actually a, um, you know, a, a, a essentially a Byzantine-Turkish negotiation, and in fact, uh, Andley she sent the small fleet in the Dardanelles, uh, by by which the block the naval block of the Turks was broken. The Crusader army was concentrated in Buda, that even in there was the the main gathering uh, base on. On the Danube to re reconnect with uh, with the to link up with the Venetians in the in the capital and in the summer of the, I mean Constantinople and in in the summer of 1396 it surpassed the Danube, prosecuting towards Nicopolis that was put under siege. On September the 25th, however, the Christian forces were disastrously defeated by Bayezid, right? And King Sigismund managed to to, to escape, uh, but many Western fighters died on the field, or were taken prisoners. Some of them were also actually executed 
it was a brutal thing to tell this all. Um, and uh, here, I, I will not digress more than much on the tactical meaning of these battles. We'll have to analyze them. But, you know, it's this phase of, uh, if you want, you know, sometimes I address the fact that in late Middle Ages was a refeudalization of warfare, which is true in Western Europe. These battles start to see how, you know, limited even a certain option could, could be in that regard. At least more flexible tactics here had the had the edge at the end of the day. That, that is not something to be intended deterministically, though. That is to say that, you know, Western cavalry was, you know, was declining, was, you know, was not useful, they should have not used it. No. But we start seeing definitely uh, a capacity from the other side, right? That must be understood even in here uh, under the light, not of a linear um, teleological deterministic evolution of war. There wasn't something like that proper. The Crusaders did, you know, what the, they, they could. I mean, even just the... Uh, now we'll have to analyze it again. So, naturally, mistakes happen uh, from all sides. But the, the, the core meaning of these battles should be understood literally under the light of the fact that Wu led them was, was competent, right, from, from both sides. And that one of the two has <laughs> to... Uh, has to lose um, and uh, however more to come from hopefully from uh, in other videos so in 1397 the Ottomans aggressed Greece again occupying uh, for a short time Athens and uh, pushing up to the southern coast um, storming uh, among the the other uh, citizel, uh, citadels the Venetian Argus the situation for Constantinople was blocked uh, still as we've seen um, became desperated and Manuel II sought help in the West um, without uh, obtaining by Venice and the other Italian states but uh, just vague uh, aid promises. His ambassador however was listened by the King of France Charles VI that sent to Constantinople a small novel squad with a uh, thousand men uh, led by Jean Le Mangre, Jean the Second Le Mangre, known as Marshal Bouchico. The French arrived in Constantinople and towards the end of summer 1399, thanks to the help of, uh, of the Byzantine sovereign, managed to break the Turkish bloc of the city. And convinced that only a crusade could save the empire, Bushiko led Manuel II to, I mean, convinced him to, to, to go personally in the West in search for help. Right? And in the December of the same year, in fact, uh, together with Bushiko, Manuel II took the way of the West. He arrived in Venice. Uh, he then visited other Italian cities and eventually Paris and London. And his travel was very important, among other things, also from a cultural point of view, for the exchanges between uh, Greek and Western scholars that had, however, scars, still scars practicality from, from a political point of view. The Western uh, nations found themselves, in fact, paralyzed by either internal questions um, or by reciprocal contrasts and nobody was I mean the hundred years war altogether what had been going on um, and nobody was actually uh, capable uh, at some levels uh, to commit seriously for the faraway empire of Constantinople that's also another thing we have to consider I mean we're talking about the, the 14th to the 15th century here um, you know there are contingencies at a local level you can't say you can't even hope that the states would all act together like simply because given the, 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 the polities as they were there was no such thing like that common good right and that's what we should get in, in uh, as a mindset generally speaking thinking of these times we don't have to read them for eventually what would happen but what were the real contingencies of all these states but just think about, about the expenses Right, it's not they went to the crusade like the one of Nicopolis, like ju just like camping was very costly to 
just even put together all this stuff and still it ended disastrously and the fact that there was still an interest to do it that's the amazing thing that's the thing we should evaluate instead um, however the presence of Manuel II in the West provoked a wide interest and was in uh, it, it can be read into the humanistic movement that um, was at that time in full development giving to this uh, an important acceleration one of his principal collaborators uh, Manuel Chrysoloras that was pupil of the scholar Demetrius uh, Kidonis had been called as a teacher of Greek in the Florentine studium where he taught from 1397 to 1400 and he had among his own pupils in turn the humanist Guarino Veronese. This is very important because um, we, we, we made uh, several videos about humanism, we, we explained exactly what, what, what are the causes to which this, um, this was not like, you know, Constantinople falls, all these scholars go to the West, Renaissance happened. No, it, it, it didn't happen like that, right? It, things of that scale, especially, do not happen by the slightest by that. And especially, um, you know, there can't be any improvement if there is no base uh, that, that is capable to, to f effectively integrate and develop uh, and capitalize upon those those treasures that surely came from the East. Um, but the thing is important though, because just if for the just think about the reevaluation of Greek. In Western Europe, very few scholars right knew Greek at the time. Florence actually since the mid 14th century had had this interesting what had been the cradle actually. Um, Boccaccio I think was the first uh, real uh, Greek teacher uh, on a public scale in, in, in Western Europe. So Fl Florence naturally was the the, the, the cradle of humanism, of, uh, you know, with the, by far the, the most advanced um, philological, philosophical center of Europe, and the contacts were triggered with this diplomatic relations and beyond, actually, because here we're talking even about Venice as an important humanistic center in its own regard. The contact with the East proper and all these uh, Greek speaking. Uh, scholars coming from the Byzantine Empire and however in front of the inertia of, of the European powers Constantinople seemed to be at the end but an event changed an important uh, set of in international situations as in July of 1402 the Ottoman army was annihilated at Ankara by the Mongolian Mongol chieftain Timur Lenk, Timur Lenk. Um, here even you know his ethnic origin is you know altogether mostly was Turkic maybe maybe even actually mixed in the area with Indo-Europeans um, it's another thing but the like the, the Mongol legacy of Timur Lenk we also made a video about the Timur army actually uh, is he's even it and he, he made this lightning expansion towards uh, towards the west in the Anatolian Peninsula it would be in fact the westernmost area that he reached he had invaded Syria defeated the Mamluks and so on so um, this procured um, uh, an important uh, stop uh, to the same Ottoman advance right the east had been overwhelmed uh, by had been uh, yeah overwhelmed by, by the Timurid invasion uh, investing the same Ottoman power. Bayezid was made prisoner and even after the retreat of the Mongols from Asia Minor in 1403 the uh, succession to his throne gave uh, origin to violent clashes uh, within the uh, within the sons that were destined to terminate in 1413 with the rise at power of Mehmet I, that up to his death in 1421 maintained actually good relations with the Roman Empire. Manuel II come back in, uh, in, in, in his fatherland in 1403 um, could obtain, because of the new international situation, some modest advan territorial advantage um, at, to the detriment of his enemies among which uh, was the re-acquisition uh, of Thessalonica 
and of the Mount Athos. Also, the blockade of Constantinople was uh, released, and at the same time, the vassalage and the annual tribute to pay to the Ottomans um, ceased. So, the, the crisis of the Ottoman Empire in this phase and the consequent uh, defeat in 1402 brought um, to certain years of calm that were marked also by the cultural flourishing of Mistress, by the work of the despot Theodore II Palaeologus and the humanist Georgamistus Platon, one of the most prolific thinkers of his time. And in Mistress, there was a paradoxal revival of Hellenism, in open contrast with the general uh, decay of what we call the Byzantine War. Right? When I'm not digressing on the, the, the interpretations, the judgments here, because I do believe there was a decline at this point. I mean, it's pretty evident. I mean, the, the Byzantines didn't even control uh, much more than, than Constantinople. But one cannot object either that there was in this broader Byzantine world that, you know, in the last times, even in the ones of crisis, certain development of, of humanism, of, you know, banking, surely not in the same ways, I don't know, the Westerners were doing, um, the Italians always maintained, for example, the upper hand from a financial point of view, uh, the local forms of banking were, were simpler, it was no, I mean, society was different, right, it was a much less dynamic, kinetic reality. Uh, wealth was distributed in a different way. But indeed, there was this, this movement of also support, in my opinion, by the crisis, because the crisis do make this, do take, do, do help people to, to give the very best of them. And this part is, is very fascinating, right? And the contact, especially with the West, is, is remarkable, but uh, I, would, I would say even more, it is this autochthonous um, revival in, in Greece itself. Right, uh, Morea, in the first half of the 15th century, became sort of the vivarium of, um, I don't even know how to say, of gracity, we could say, of Greekness. And it showed also um, a remarkable political vitality, managing to subdue the whole Peloponnese, for example, uh, except the Venetian colonies of Coron, Modon, Argos, and Nauplion. In 1432, in fact, uh, it was also subdued the Latin principality of Achaia, uh, thus uh, terminating the, uh, con the the Frankish Byzantine contrast for the possession of the Peloponnese that had begun since the times of Michael VIII. So, to better protect Morea, also Manuel Palaiologos had the uh, the Examilian built, famously the f famous strong bastion. And, uh, uh, for forces, mostly in a defensive uh, sense, all over the Corinthian isthmus. Uh, if you visit Greece, uh, it's beautiful to to watch the the, the remains. Um, just the, the place is amazing in many ways. Um, it's one of the few places I actually visited in Greece, but um, it, it's just there are certain landscapes, certain things, that, and if you think of the history that passed through there, say just wow. So Ottoman power, however, ca came back uh, to be aggressive with the Sultan Murad II, 1421, 1451, uh, that uh, who revoked the privileges obtained from the Byzantines, and in 1422 he besieged for for a certain time Constantinople. In 1423, also southern Greece was sacked and the Examilian was destroyed. In 1424 the government of Constantinople was obliged to a uh, humiliating peace with which was repersonated the previous condition of vassalage towards the Turks. In 14, uh, 1430, finally, also Thessalonica fell, right? After having been strenuously defended by the Venetians, who, uh, to whom, you know, um, with the possibility of defending the city, the, the empire had entrusted it uh, in 1423, right? Thessalonica was the basically the only true city in the empire after Constantinople, right? The, the, the rest of the Byzantine world had not developed, let's say urbanism had generally declined, 
right? And these were the only two centers. In fact, the Thessalonians didn't even like Constantinople pretty much because that's exactly one center. I was saying before about those, you know, it, it, there were entrepreneurial oligarchies that would have liked to, to be freer, more autonomous from the central government. And just because also Thessalonica was historically very dynamic, as we've seen, it was at the center of a very fertile region. And it was opened to, to the Aegean uh, historically uh, and maritime trade and so on. Um, and in, in this case, however, which shows how the, uh, the resources, the imperial resources were limited, even also for the sake of self-defense. Here, but the Venetians are like always in the middle because, of course, they, um, they have enormous interests still, of course, in the empire. They start looking at the Ottomans and saying, wait, we should, you know, understand what, what, the, what are the options now. Um, but fundamentally, they, they care enormously for these assets, especially not to fall in the hands of a, you know, try to keep the balance in a way so they could intervene here and there being the tip of the balance, which w they were not the only ones, right? Even, I don't know, the Knights of Rhodes, for example, supported the, uh, for example, the stabilization of the Ottoman state uh, during uh, they, they made it in uh, the civil war and that was a time uh, after I mean after the Battle of Ankara all the, the, the strifes between uh, within the Ottomans and um, the mm, at, at that time concretely the Ottomans could have been stopped I mean had there been an intervention like in Asia Minor it could have been done it could have been done there were the resources was there was everything but it was not done expressly because they said you know let's see how the thing eventually unfolds uh you know when one power shrank from one side another re-expanded so the question here is as we've seen was also a, a specific uh, attrition but also with venetians in itself so uh, it's not easy to 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 look at the balance of the scale right um but um let's say it, it Manuel, the Manuel II's successor, the son John VIII, Palaiologos, 1425-1448, was the third sovereign to go in search of help in the West, where for, uh, on his father's behalf, he had been some years before with the same intent. There are, there are also beautiful Renaissance portrayals of him, famously enough, the ones from Benozzo Cozzoli. Um, and uh, I've even inserted the year here among the pictures. So, and differently from Manuel II, um, that had basically always remained skeptical about it, John decided to play the extreme card of the religious re reunification. This was a big deal, right? It never came to an end. Uh, I, I realize at this point of 900 videos we made here we never fully addressed the the schism between east and west and uh, we we however addressed the, this last phase seeing how in fact there was a sort of double thread here for, from within the same byzantine perspective because the emperor were as the elites are are way more intelligent and, and pragmatic and, and reasonable and they realized that it that the religious reunification can really trigger a lot of helps to Constantinople, the arrival of a lot of them. And the other one is uh, instead the popular feeling that was never pro-Catholic so much that in fact famously enough they preferred they preferred the Muslims to to the Catholics. This is a real thing. I mean, even the same fall of Constantinople, you think it was just military. No, no there was a, an active help from, from within the, 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 the city populace. Uh, as it happens, by the way, in, in all other contexts, like there's not a single context in, the, in here where, you know, one city was unanimously pro-defense or surrender, right? It, it, there were always, uh, people were both but also that had specific uh, specific interest, uh, politically speaking, for this to happen. And the religious factor should not be underestimated. So, um, he, in 1438, reached Italy with the intention to convert to the Roman faith for eventually 
you know, trying or hoping to convince these people to, to make the same, at least formally. Um, the emperor brought with himself the patriarch Joseph II together with a good number of clergymen and monks um, and a council was summoned. Famously it was opened in Ferrara in 1438, then there was the plague so they had to actually to finish it in Florence in 1439 with the proclamation of, ju just think about the omen of the thing, you know, I mean, uh, start a council for the religious reunification and a plague breaks out in a freaking city where you chose the thing to happen. Um, but in Florence, actually, the religious unification was proclaimed, right? So actually, for whatever, you know, uh, from a formal point of view, that actually happened. The Paleologus offered now desperately the reconciliation of the fates in order to make Constantinople survive, but also in, in this attempt he never set the desired effect. It didn't get the desired effect. And in fact, as it had already happened in 1274, the reunification, in fact, it had already been tried, um, found um, strong resistance in the Byzantine church and populace, uh, aside from some meaningful excep excep uh, exceptions in the high clergy, that were connected uh, interestingly also with that humanistic meeting we were saying before for example the, the famous bishop cardinal Bessario that was actually a, a, an orthodox Greek he converted to Catholicism and became a Catholic cardinal um, he lived in Rome he had a and also in Venice he had a uh, he had a, a great role in, in also preserving saving lots of manuscripts from the Ottoman advance and so on um, we speak also of Isidore of Kiev that remained orthodox, but you know favored the for me the f favored the reunification of the two churches. They both actually went to w went in Italy, obtaining uh, eventually the, the cardinal proposal. Both and the sole political consequence, uh, I mean, which is not a few, but um, we know even in here how it's gone was a crusade was promoted by Eugene the Fourth that wrote to uh, that moved actually f still from Hungary as habitual this was mostly a um, it was not such an um, it was not a huge participation from the westerners proper it was mostly central european and balkanic thing um, and um, that however started from Hungary in 1443 and resolved itself with this clamorous failure the year after uh, so we're talking obviously about Varna and also about this we'll make the video of the battle uh, of the campaign hopefully also about this we, we discussed elsewhere so the to make a long story short the crusade uh, was uh, in existence between 1443 1444 and it was commonly known in fact as the Varna crusade and at the beginning it was actually crowned by a promising success the papal appeal for the expedition found a uh, favorable welcoming and in southern Hungary was gathered an army led by the king of Poland, Ladislas III. Again, the, the voivode of Transylvania, John Corvinus Huniadi, hmm, the Serbian despot George Brankovic, who had been overthrown uh, from his country by the Turks. And to this army, then uh, there were other reinforcements guided by the uh, papal legate, the Cardinal Giuliano Cesarini. And uh, the crusade army, composed by roughly 25,000 men, um, to which were added along the way 8,000 Serbians, crossed the Danube at the beginning of 1443. And it arrived up to Bulgaria, and from here in trace, uh, by obtaining a series of brilliant victories over the enemy. The military operations were suspended during winter, as was normal at the time, but the situation continued to be favorable to the Crusaders. So at this point, Murad II, uh, and this is important, this, this also tells you often about how what the strategies this time were, were fundamentally about, um, was committed in crushing the revolt in Asia Minor. It had been a big deal. I mean, if you know Byzantine history, it's plenty of situations in which, as big as the empire was, 
the main army, Bombay army, was, was involved somewhere. Uh, maybe on the opposite front of the empire, something bad happened, like an invasion from another mobile army. There were just provincial forces there. So that was a, you know, a very good way. You have to imagine, you know, what is important to, to picture this like is that all of these polities were continuously one step away from complete annihilation. Like, not even the strongest of powers was was in a state which could say, okay, well, now we're just waiting and seeing. No, they were all a step away from disaster. We're all worn out by something that was tearing them apart, right? So there was plenty of these possibilities, after all, all the time. And, and that's, that's what history in synthesis does not help to understand, because we like to stress in there the big reasons, the big causes, but it was never like that. Right, there were big reasons and big causes, but maybe what actually made the decisive difference was just one stupid thing that nobody would have ever imagined, and that's how it went. How do you think a battle is lost? Right, uh, it, it's difficult to answer. We know it even just from phone calls of it, but let alone think about a, a campaign or a war um, in general. So, and think about politics and society. Well, what can happen in there at the same time? Uh, so. The Ottomans were freaking out, rightfully, um, also because uh, contemporarily Albania had uh, rose up and the troops of the Byzantine despot of Morea, Constantine Palaiologos, had passed on the offensive in central Greece. The Sultan um, made, therefore, certain uh, truce proposals and in June 1444 he agreed for for an armistice of 10 years that at the end however was rejected by the Christians with exception of the Serbian despot who had bailed out from the enterprise. The um, crusading forces took on again the march towards Black Sea where they, uh, they, they were hoping to embark on the Venetian fleet in Varna and to reach Constantinople so the naval and terrestrial operations, however, were poorly coordinated. The Venetians belated uh, their arrival, well, and at, at the same time, they didn't manage to prevent Murad II to ship across the Bosphorus a strong contingent of Asian troops. On November the 10th, 1444, the Turkish forces, that were almost tribal, the ones of the enemy, engaged the crusaders in Varna on the coast of the Black Sea. The Christians fought with heroic determination but the, at the end they were they were uh, destroyed, leaving among the uh, dead the King Ladislas, the Cardinal Cesarini. The, um, the, su the survivors also, you know, the army was gone. So, and, and uh, just a few of them managed to actually save themselves. Uh, so Varna is uh, definitely, if you think that Constantinople eventually fell in 1453, even in here was actually a, uh, an important uh, turning point, right? It was definitely the proof that still at the end, so lots of things, actually if you look at those videos I made, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't remember the title, I would like to say now, but whatever. Um, we explain how not even after Varna things went smoothly towards the end, right? So even this, but definitely, at least for what we were saying before about the Westerners, it didn't uh, affect, uh, you know, it, it's a good proof of actually Western commitment, or at least, you know, the, uh, the, the definitely the effort that was still made to stop this so closely to the the end so from from that side so everything naturally can be seen in relative terms that is to say yes like if all the the, the countries that contributed fully the, lots of things might have changed the point is also here it would be interesting to study the expanses the the sustainability even of these armies in the local places because actually as we've seen they they the objective was to go to Constantinople in both in, in both times and from there eventually to uh, to go on against the Turks but the question evidently has become something um, uh, you know 
often saying, ah, you know, those Westerners never cared, woke up after Constantinople fell. In part it is true. In part it is true. In part we've seen uh, before has there were other problems around uh, that, you know, it, it is not even to give to have been given for granted that these powers may have arrived for the means the situation, the uh, international situation of the time, I mean, it was a huge cost. So it's a big deal it happened, um, but even in here there are other traditional factors that we can read uh, and that are surely, uh, you know, heavy and uh, even the same hist history of these campaigns and battles definitely deserves to be studied uh, more closely. Um, so, for now, uh, I would stop it here, um, and I hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content, and for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time, bye.